Hello everyone, welcome back to A Message of Hope. My name is Monet Souza and today I'm joined with a good friend, Amanda Gately. And we're gonna be talking about how we can heal from our false perception of self and begin to see ourselves the way that God does. Amanda, can you open us up in prayer? I'd love to. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Come Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, I just come in praise and thanks for this day. I just want to praise you for your, your beautiful daughter, Monet, and her ministry of a message of hope. And Lord Jesus, I just ask that you anoint all of our words and our conversation. And Holy Spirit, I just ask that you guide us in whatever the Lord is willing us to speak. I ask for the intercession of the Blessed Mother. Mama Mary, I just ask that you look so kindly and tenderly upon us during this time. And I just ask that you please through the intercession of your son, Jesus, guide us to whatever the Lord is willing us to do today. I pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Amanda, this is a long time coming. I know. Thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm excited. No, same here. <laughs> I, so a little backstory of how Amanda and I met, it mm -hmm. was through a youth minister who Amanda ended up taking the role of, so now mm -hmm. Amanda is in that position of being a youth minister in um, Hingham. Mm -hmm. But we got introduced through Alyssa, who Alyssa's been on the guest, a uh, guest on the show mm -hmm. before. And then I remember you sending me an email of your testimony mm -hmm. of just your, your journey through body image mm -hmm. and your faith. And I remember you saying, if you ever need a guest, <laughs> I'm here. And that was about Very two open. years ago. Yeah, so truly. So we are here now um, with God's timing. And yeah, yes. I'm just really grateful for you being on the show today. Yeah, no, I'm very excited to be here. Um, it's such a gift. I've seen, we always invite Monet to do our confirmation retreats, and there's been such fruit with that through a message of hope. So it's kind of interesting to be on the other side of it now. Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to chat today. Definitely. Well, can you start by introducing yourself to those who are watching? Yes. So as Monet mentioned, my name is Amanda Gately. I'm the coordinator of youth ministry in Hingham. So that's for Resurrection St. Paul's Parish. I'm in my second year there, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. It's been such a blessing. Um, if you had asked me a couple years ago if I would be doing this, I would have laughed in your face because <laughs> God's just crazy and his intentionality. But I grew up in Pembroke, Mass, um, and I now live in Weymouth, so South Shore gal. And <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, before I worked um, in Hingham, I worked at the Archdiocese of Boston at the Pastoral Center. And um, prior to that, I graduated college um, from St. Anselm College in COVID. So there was a lull in that time, and I did six months of service at my brother's keeper. And up until now, the Lord's guided me to Hingham. So, yeah, just very blessed in how the Lord's orchestrated everything because I couldn't have imagined it or done any, done any of that myself. Yeah, so, yeah. no, praise God. And yeah. even you know, with the topic today is very much the topic you presented to me about two mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. of your journey mm -hmm. with, you know, seeing yourself as just solely Amanda mm -hmm. and those lies that may have come into your life and then being able to see yourself as Amanda, a child of God and mm -hmm. seeing your worth and identity and especially your body mm -hmm. image in that sort of light. So can you give us a little bit of a backstory of yeah, just where, where you've come, and then we can yeah. begin to talk about where you are now. Yeah, so I'm going to be 26 this year, and I've only been devout for about four years. So when I was in college, um, I mean, even before that, I grew up in a more lukewarm Catholic family, but just never connected to the faith personally or had a relationship with Jesus. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, and it was my junior year of college, and... Um, a roommate I had at the time, she had a deep relationship with Jesus. And I was like, yo, that's crazy. Didn't know that was even a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I just got really curious about it. Um, and now looking back, I know why. It's at that time I developed an eating disorder. So I suffered from anorexia for around three years. Um, and at that time, my curiosity toward the faith grew because I did something that was very successful in a worldly lens, meaning I, I lost a lot of weight at the time. So to the world, that's a really, really good thing. Um, and although I lost weight, I gained an eating disorder. So it was kind of in that time that I started pursuing the Lord and he 
praise God, just planted a lot of seeds in my faith in college and put a lot of intentional people. And then I graduated in 2020, which was an absolute hot mess of a time. And it kind of stripped me of everything, of any distraction, of any identity um, that I had lived in, whether it was a college student or a leader on campus. Um, so it was within that stripping that the only thing I had left was my anorexia and I just ran toward it because I very much sought it as a means of control mm -hmm. to comfort myself. And so coupled with just having an eating disorder, a lot of um, you know depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, kind of all that um, was coupled with it. So as I deepened in my suffering, my faith increased though. So although I graduated just in a very interesting time, it gave me more time to seek the Lord and seek my faith. And because I was suffering more deeply, my dependence on Jesus increased as well. Um, so kind of from there, I, um, again, as I was going along in my faith, the Lord highlighted, you know, a lot of things that were wrong. Um, and especially through scripture, I learned about who God was and Jesus's character and that they're not willing me to suffer necessarily. Um, and I would ask the Lord, I said, Lord, why, if you say you love me so much, why am I suffering so deeply? And I remember a time in prayer and the Lord just said, like, Amanda, it's not supposed to be this way. Like, you're meant for so much more. So, yeah, it was just through the encounters of Jesus and him healing me and me actually learning about him and in turn learning about myself and my true identity as a daughter of God rather than putting my identity in the instant gratification of people's opinions or um, perception of myself. It allowed me to enter into that and truly live in that confidence that truly saved my life um, at the end of the day because uh, it wasn't, I got so sick that I almost lost my life. So, yeah. Well, no, thank mm -hmm. you for sharing all of that and even being transparent with mm -hmm. me, with yourself, and then with mm -hmm. all of those who are watching today. But that is so real of what is still being pushed mm -hmm. in society's lens, which you're, you're touching on, of mm -hmm. society still mm -hmm. wants, which is crazy because I feel like we would have gotten past this yeah. long, a long time ago, but they're still putting this pressure of, losing weight, going on a diet, all this, like your exterior must look perfect. And mm. if you don't fit into this, these size pants, or if you don't have this look of body that resembles someone who probably struggles with their own imperfections, mm. but we're setting them up as a God, a lowercase g God. But we, yeah, those are unrealistic expectations mm. of pressure that we put on ourselves. Yeah. And then very quickly, we begin to make that our own personal God and we forget Mm. how God created us to be. And that's exactly what we were talking about the other day of mm. God created us not just good, but you had said so well. And we see this in Genesis, like God created man and woman mm. to be very good. Yeah. And there's a goodness in how our bodies are made up. Some people being like, you know, cert looking a certain way, having a certain hair color, whatever it may be. But mm. during that time, was it like, how did you hear the truth of whose you were, even mm -hmm. at like your lowest of low, like maybe in the, in the hospital or yeah. whether it was like when 2020 hit and everything was being stripped away, mm -hmm. how, how were you able to hear that truth be spoken and then yeah. it, it, accept it and enter it in, into mm -hmm. your own heart? Yeah, um, I definitely think it was through scripture because at the time um, there wasn't mass because the churches were closed. so. I encountered the Lord so deeply in his word and what reading scripture does and what it definitely did for myself is it created a different narrative in my head because at that point I was like all you think about like 99% of the time is how's my body look what am I eating next like how much did I exercise how many calories did I burn how many did I take in like it's never ending mm. and it would take me a lot of mental focus because I was so malnourished at the time that um, my cognitive function was so bad, but the Lord would still give me some type of grace. And when I would open his word with like, without a doubt, almost every time it was a truth spoken to me. And so what it did was create a different dialogue for me to kind of cling to because my interior dialogue was so bad. But as you pray with scripture and as you, um, truly believe it, or you want to believe it, 
the Lord can work so deeply in that. And that's what he did with myself. So I kind of was at a point where I was hearing so many lies, living in so many lies that this different narrative, it would feel so personal when Mm -hmm. I would just read a piece of scripture that I was like, oh my gosh, like I didn't even know God would say that. Mm -hmm. Like that is crazy. Or how did he know to say that to me? Like it was that individual healing and, you know, him saying, Amanda, like, I do see you. I do love you. I don't want this for you. Um, and yeah, it was just trusting in it. I, I would love to just read scripture because it would be so comforting. It was a lifeline for me, honestly, at that point. Um, but it was very contradicting, right? Because I was still living in this kind of despair and believing the lies and it just took time. It took time. It took, um, conviction, about a lot of things and I I feel like I still yeah I still struggle uh in a, in a lot of ways and it's just a matter of recognizing actually I can like capture a thought put it at the foot of the cross renounce it in the name of Jesus and announce the truth in place of it mm-hmm. um but yeah that took a while to like actually recognize that and yeah it's still it's still going on we're still trying to heal so yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask you a question, and if you feel comfortable enough answering, go for it. But my <laughs> really, question, I'm an open book. So. Amazing. So my question is, because I'm trying to place myself in when I struggled with my own body image, mm. um, you know, lies of just not looking like the size zero, size mm. two girls that I played sports with or went to school with. Mm. And my difficulty was I just... I would get so frustrated with my body when I was in a changing room at Mm. like the mall or something. And just this frustration of like, why is nothing fitting? Like it probably fits that other girl that like I'm thinking of my head. Like, and all of a sudden I realized like a hatred of how my body was built by God. And then also a Mm. immediate comparison of other girls that Mm. like would be going through my head of like, well, she probably doesn't struggle with these same things. So I know kind of where, that was rooted from in my life but Mm -hmm. for someone who does struggle with anorexia Mm -hmm. and an eating disorder when does that get fostered like is that something Mm -hmm. that happens overnight or like how does that like where's the root of that or is it different in terms of the insecurity of it of like having that fixation yeah even like it's it's starting like is it as simple as it could start in that changing room and you're making that resolution to yourself then no that's a really good question i think it's very individual per person. I can say for myself, um, I grew up in a bigger body, which fine, but based on societal messaging and messaging that I was getting at home or at school, like, yeah, that comparison start. I feel like it starts with comparison, honestly, for most people, Mm -hmm. because you're like, I want what they have. So with, within that instance of comparison, you cannot have gratitude. You can't have gratitude for your body. You can't have gratitude for the Lord and what he's given you because you're wanting what somebody else has. And so, I mean, that's how the enemy works in it and that it's a very slippery slope. But I can say for myself how it kind of developed into the severity of it was after I lost a big chunk of weight, I looked, it was like over a summer and I looked completely different going into um, my junior year of college and Never in my life had I gotten so much affirmation, so much attention, Mm -hmm. so much. I was like, people treated me so different and the fixation was on my body. It was a constant, you know, it wasn't, hey, Amanda, how are you? It's, oh my gosh, you look so good. And Mm so what that did is reinforce the fact, actually, I do need to be thin to be loved. Actually, I do need to be thin to be noticed, heard, seen, understood, um, And it reinforced the fact as well that people were looking at me. And so because so many people were looking at me, I had to make it perfect. I said, wow, like in this case, if everybody's already looking and saying stuff, I have to be perfect. Like I can't, I can't gain weight. Like, and so I just got thinner and thinner and thinner. And as I got smaller, I got more affirmed. And so it just, yeah, it reinforced those beliefs that I had as a child and into, you know, early adulthood that they were, came true. But the biggest thing, and this is how Jesus really came into the picture, was it didn't make me feel the way I thought it did. 
Mm. It made me feel so empty. And so it was very, very confusing because I was living off of this instant gratification, meaning like if I had somebody compliment me, it would give me like a little... I, or like was, a little high. Yeah, like a pride, right? Mm-hmm. But then as soon as that didn't happen or if somebody didn't say something, I'd be like, I'm gaining weight. Like this is happening. Like it's a constant. So you're living off that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you get to a point where you resent people for saying those things because in retrospect, it's digging you deeper into a hole. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's su- that's why they're super, I mean, they just perpetuate and people relapse or, you know, they can be deadly because it's so, it's such a toxic um, cycle to break out of. I believe it. And even too, that's exactly what the, like this self perception of self can, or even the false perception of self can be fostered by is what do other people think of me? And to be completely honest, like I, like where that resonates with me in my life is this ministry stuff. It's, oh my goodness, like if I'm not posting every single Thursday, which all of you at home know, there's been a couple Thursdays I've missed, (laughs) but like if I'm not posting every Thursday, if I'm not looking put together for certain videos, if I'm not hitting X um, amount of speaking gigs, like all of a sudden, what is everyone else gonna think of like me, my ministry, my name, like that's where my struggle is and that could very much Um, send me down into a spiral and it could be a whole variety of things for all of you who are watching I don't know exactly what each and every one of you struggle with but when we are so because it's so easy like I feel like we're walking this tightrope that is like a finer line than we may perceive it to be maybe like specifically for your life Amanda or in general even with like the ministry work you do at the church like how it's so easy to all of a sudden fall into like what's everyone else thinking like and we want to lean into that Mm -hmm. but in those moments, how, like what keeps you leaning into what God is saying yeah. about who you are, what you look like, and what you're doing? Yeah, no, it's a good question, and I think, oh gosh, a lot of the a lot of the roots of my anorexia and like, because there's always a root, there's always a root cause, and I learned them through therapy mm-hmm. and treatment and stuff, um, and just prayer and spiritual direction. But um, for myself, it's people pleasing, worrying about or taking a lot on as a means to be like, no, I'm in charge. I have to get this all done. But I think there's a very toxic narrative um, in our minds is if we make a mistake, we're bad. Mm. We say, you know, I'm bad. It's like the the same thing with body image within itself, right? Like if you actually look at the definition of body image, it says a subjective view or mental image of one's like perception of their body. Meaning if it's subjective, it varies per subject right and so one thing I've learned is you have to root yourself in the objective truth that you are a child of God that literally because of that infinite like indelible mark on you you truly anything that you do say anything somebody else does or says to you literally does not touch that And so when I say I'm bad, I'm bad because I ate a cookie, I'm bad because I went up a pan size, I'm bad because I missed a a video on Thursday, I'm bad because a retreat didn't go as planned. When When we have this narrative in our head, we're actually offending God. Because as we mentioned before, like you're going against that very goodness that you're created from. So nothing can touch that. So it's a straight lie. If we're saying that to ourselves or saying that about others, um, and it's where that like our words have so much impact too, I've learned. Um, and so it's like one, being mindful of my interior dialogue along with what I speak to others. And I think that's where healing can begin. Um, mm-hmm. And you can kind of counteract those lies that you're hearing. 100%. And even you had, I had sent you a text about, um, or maybe, a, no, it definitely was you. There was either plans that changed or something happened. And I said an <laughs> I am statement that was completely false. And immediately you're like, Hey, like, yeah, careful of like the words that you're saying, like, that's, that's not a truth. And I should know this, like literally for these retreats <laughs> that I'm doing, I'm like, Oh my gosh, doing these games with the kids of like, I am statements, like step forward. Like, you know, if this yeah. pertains to you and we oftentimes do place these are, we make our own truth or we allow society to create a truth for us that we adopt into the recesses of our hearts. And then we begin to live out of them, act out of them. And 
yeah, like it's so important what we speak over ourselves throughout the day. It's either going to be complete truths or lies. It's either going to be words that God says to us that we see in scripture that, okay, maybe, you know, like your example, which was perfect when you would pick up scripture, you may not have had the words to say, you may have like three years of hearing what other people were like saying about your body or what you were even like feeding your own mind with or the devil, whatever it was. If we don't have the words to say, turn to scripture and then speak that truth over you until you can find the words to say it yourself. Yeah, That's like, I think the best place to begin or even to like go back to Genesis. Why did God create us and how did he create us and what's his purpose? Like, because I think I know that the devil, I remember, I, was, I forget who I was talking to, but the devil desires us to be in isolation. He doesn't want us to have community. He wants us to believe God doesn't love us. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately the way the devil succeeds is if he gets us to commit suicide yep. because he is, dr- he is trying to shove us all the way into a dark corner as much as he can with yep. all the help of his like fellow demons. Mm-hmm. And if he can get you to commit suicide, then he has made you to believe that your life has no meaning, no worth. You're like, no one values you. No one loves you. Um, so it's a constant battle. So Amanda, where do you find that strength? Cause like, <laughs> I definitely need to hear from um, yeah. you as well. Like, where do you put on this armor of Christ and mm. where do you run to, to fill your cup? Oh gosh. I mean, it's so funny. Cause um, I've just been talking about this. A lot of my spiritual life, a lot of people call me strong like my personality or even people hear my testimony and I've always taken it in like weird ways. Uh, Like we've talked about this just in the terms of being trying to be feminine and stuff. And so, but I always look to our lady in the sense I'm like, listen, she's the most beautiful creature ever created, but she's also standing on the head of a serpent. Like you can't be like a wussy to like do that. So, um, but I think for myself, it's a constant, yeah, it's a constant like, reorienting reorienting my mind to Christ um and because I think it's it's a struggle at times like I can say for myself like my pride being like no I can do it I can do it I can get through it all these things and it's like I have to you know renounce that and take on God as my strength so Mm -hmm. I mean uh, prayer is probably the most important thing within that because if I'm not talking to Jesus and receiving him in prayer and within that love like I can't have the strength. And Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's just, I mean, in adoration, especially, um, and the armor I think comes from the fact of like the love that the Lord's like bestowing upon me. He's saying you're clothed in my love and in my precious blood, thus nothing can touch you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just been a constant kind of, um, yeah, battle to even do that. Because you're being, I, I still struggle with a lot of thoughts and a lot of lies. Um, so it's a constant kind of mental game of, you know, that's actually not from God. And I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to believe in the lies over our Lord and what he says of me. Um, so, yeah, it's just a constant kind of reorienting our mind to Christ. And I think within that, the Lord so delights in that. He's so pleased by it that he'll give you increased graces to like get through stuff, I guess. Definitely. And even for adoration, you know, when we're truly in his presence, mm-hmm. like temptation doesn't stop there. No, no. At all. But at least we can fix our eyes on him as our source of all and yeah. the one who is love himself. But I'm trying to think like, you know, for anyone who is watching, like someone who specifically guy or girl is going through some sort of body dysmorphia or eating disorder, mm-hmm. Um, what are and what were some practical resources that we can share with them that helped with you and are still helping Mm. um, you through this journey? Yeah, I definitely think, I mean, for myself personally, I went into treatment for around five months. Um, It was in intensive therapy. But, um, and so kind of after that, obviously, like the whole goal is, so there's a lot of tools within that, but even more so, it's kind of like, what do you take from that and implement? Um, I think, yeah, therapy, spiritual direction has been really huge for me. And I personally, I have a priest as my spiritual director. So because a priest has authority over us, the words that they speak are 
of greater value, honestly. Mm -hmm. And they speak that truth deeper into us. So if you have a good priest as well that like you want to receive spiritual direction from, or even confession could be, obviously it's the sacrament of healing. So I think going to confession as well. But in terms of like actually combating the thoughts and like if somebody is going through it, um, you have to seek help. Um, So I can, we'll put stuff in the show notes um, Mm -hmm. to kind of, guide in that but also a big thing that I've done that's been so healing and very helpful is I'll write out the lies I'll write write out all the lies that I'm feeling about myself and when you write them they become true almost like it's what I write let's say like I'm not beautiful okay that's like an actual physical thing now in front of me not just something I'm thinking but it's the same difference when I speak a truth into it mm-hmm. and replace it so that's something I try to continue to do is kind of the renouncing of the lies and the announcing of the truth. Um, And so within that, that's very helpful. But yeah, it's all uh, a big part of it is like you have, like people can't read minds. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to like, when I was super sick, like I was very good at hiding it. So it wasn't until like I went to the doctor that things came about because it was pen to paper, like actually not good and that my parents do and so on so yeah it's seeking help which is probably like the biggest thing uh but in the meantime if you haven't received that yet it's like just running toward our lord and asking him to provide too Mm -hmm. um a lot of the things that happened to me and like the provision and the providence uh i couldn't uh, the way i explain it is like i couldn't have done it myself without god like he did things for me i couldn't do for myself so yeah Amanda, my last question for you. (laughs) What is the greatest amount of freedom or like in what form has that freedom been shown to you through your, um, yeah, coming out of this eating disorder? Oh, gosh. Um, I think like the freedom of just not having to be so tethered to the world and the world's opinions and like, how people perceive me and it's truly like although I still struggle with that and struggle with the people pleasing and like looking a certain way and all these things like I have the truth and I have the freedom in our Lord it's like that is always my source of freedom and so it's like just even having the freedom and the identity to live as a daughter of God and always go back to that Mm. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing because within that like it's also within forgiveness too. I've had to forgive a lot of people and like myself. So that's offered me a lot of freedom too, to not be so resentful, to not be so hurt, to not hold on to these things, but rather just genuinely give it to the Lord and have him take care of it has been super freeing. So, Amen. Yeah. Well, Amanda, I'm super grateful for you sharing your testimony, a uh, part of your heart with all of the viewers today and with me. And please know that we will continue to pray for you and all the good work that you're doing. Praise God. Thank you. You're welcome, Amanda. All right, everyone. God bless you again. Look at the description down below for all of those resources that Amanda and I will be sharing with you. And we'll see you again next week. God bless.